What's going on, everybody? Welcome to episode 147 of the DFS Dose podcast, your fix of daily fantasy sports information, strategy, and analysis. I'm your host, Ben Hover, joined as I always am by Joey Carrion. And on today's show, we continue our journey through my 2021 best ball tournament tiers. And to help us understand the tight end position in best ball, we are joined by a man so deeply ingrained in the best ball community that his Twitter handle is literally best ball nfl host of the run uh today light podcast part of one week seasons team todd from pa todd welcome to the show hey man nice to meet you guys and uh looking forward to talking some football (laughs) yeah absolutely this episode is part three in a four-part series each edition dedicated to a specific position you can check out the first two episodes live now on the youtube channel where we break down the quarterback position with hillo ff and the rb position with establish the runs jack miller if you're new to the podcast like what you hear you can support us by liking the video subscribing to the channel or following us on whatever podcast platform you use. It's a free, simple, and easy way to help us out. Gentlemen, before we get into these players, I just want to reiterate for new viewers that the reason that we focus on tiers in best ball opposed to straight up rankings is because the median projections in these large field tournaments, in my opinion, are less valuable, less actionable than understanding player roles, roster construction, and the different realistic ranges of outcomes that we can expect from these players. These are not projections. They are priority suggestions. Todd, I want to start with you. Everybody knows, as far as the tight end position goes, who the big three are. How important is it for you to leave one of the first two rounds in a best ball draft with one of those players, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, or George Kittle? Well, I I want to touch on something that you talked about first, Mm -hmm. which is being tiers. You know, just the, the concept of tiers. And I don't think people get that and how important it is if you're going to be doing best ball volume. Mm -hmm. All right. The, the, you know, win rates is something that I focus on a lot with best ball. I think it's important. It's a guide, but there's a lot that can be learned both from individual player win rates as well as positional win rates. And people don't understand if you're going to do a lot of best ball like I do. I've done as many as 300 in a year. It's the, what you have to fear is injury. Mm-hmm. So, what is the most important thing is to never drop a tier to, st- to chase a strategy, right? That's one of my core foundational beliefs. You never drop a tier to chase a strategy mm-hmm. early. You might drop half a tier later, but th- the whole purpose of correlating, you know, you guys are called the DFS dose. The, the whole purpose of correlating is to give yourself a better chance to win when you drop a tier to chase a correlation, often you're giving up as much as you're getting, if not more, all mm-hmm. right? So I agree with you totally on tiers. The other thing to answer your main question very directly is that win rates in the first two rounds are where they're the most severe. You have the most to win and the most to lose. So I don't feel it's important to come out of the first three rounds with a tight end but I, so I'm, I, I am much less likely to reach for a position in the first or second round. And I don't really want more than 15% of any player in the first and second round because of injury could give you a two to 4% win rate. Mm-hmm. Um, any healthy player, even someone you don't like in the first round is unlikely to be less than 6%. All right. And and just to build a little bit on what you're saying, Joey and I are sort of on the same page in the sense that we're not the type of guys that are really prioritizing going after these elite tight ends most of the time. And to me, it's a question about opportunity cost, right? Because I think that especially in the first round where Travis Kelsey is going every single trip, I want to be taking a shot at a player who has the possibility to be the number one overall fantasy scorer. I think that The upside there, especially in large field tournaments, is something you have to be utilizing your first round pick on. Um, And and Travis Kelsey simply does not have that in his range. I mean, he's going to be great. He's going to give you a weekly edge. But there's just no scenario where he's going to be the number one overall scoring player in fantasy football. Joey, do do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think you are giving up a lot in terms of value and opportunity cost by taking Travis Kelsey in the first round specifically last year and this is courtesy of Rotoviz best ball win rates for best ball 10 for best ball 10s Travis Kelsey in the first round if you drafted him had a 0.5% win rate last year if you drafted him in the second round 
he was at a 24% win rate um, mm-hmm. total. So just a vast difference. And I do think you're giving up a lot at running back. And if you want to go, you know, early wide receiver, I think you're giving up a lot in terms of ceiling. If you want to reach for Travis Kelsey specifically. Yeah. And, and see, it becomes less opportunity cost. I think when you're looking at Kittle or Waller towards the end of the second, mm-hmm. because those players have less of a chance of finishing as the number one overall player compared to, you know, those elite running backs that we're taking at the top of the first or even the mid first, um, you know, where you have to usually go with Travis Kelsey. Todd, if you're looking at these three guys, is there anyone that you think has a higher likelihood than the others to fall out of this tier by the end of this year? You know, come next year's drafts, we're not going to be looking at maybe one of these guys the same way we do now. Well, I think all three of them could fall out. Um, Mm -hmm. And and I am not against, you know, a 20% win rate is phenomenal. Uh, I do Mm -hmm. think that, you know, Kelsey has gone higher. I do a lot of my drafting on FFPC where it's uh, tight end premium. So I do think that um, if you do the research on Rotoviz, taking a tight end early because of the advantage of those tight ends over all the other tight ends, uh, you can build a very good team. Mm -hmm. I also see your point of view as well. So uh, that's why I keep my ownership pretty even with ADP. I'm not avoiding Travis Kelsey, Waller, or Kittle. Um, uh, Again, back to the question you did ask me, not the one that I interjected Mm -hmm. on. (laughs) Um, I I think that Kelsey has risk because of his age. I think Waller has risk because... um, you know, he, 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 if they, if rugs comes along, if some of the other options come along, um, he just had an inordinate uh, percentage of that team's targets that might not continue. And George Kittle is probably the one that I think has the best chance to fall out. And the reason is it's a run first team. They've got mm-hmm. Debo and Ayuk now. So I, I and he and he's one of the best blockers in fantasy football. So I, while I think all of them have a chance to fall out, I think Kittle has the highest volume concerns for me. Mm-hmm. Joey, do you agree with that? Yeah, I think I would definitely agree. Um, Waller and Kelsey are great, obviously, but I would say they are more focal points of their respective offenses than George Kittle is. Uh, like Todd mentioned, the Niners are want to be sort of a run-first team. They're going to run the ball, less volume for George Kittle and some of the other guys there. So I would agree, but I do think just in terms of pure ceiling week to week, George Kittle is, is top three, and that's obviously mm. where everybody has him ranked. Yep. And and the last note I want to make, Joey, just speaking to your point about win rates and best ball tens, you know, these these tiers specifically are more geared towards tournaments yes. and best ball tens are, are a cash format, right? So mm-hmm. I think that the rules apply just a little bit differently. I'm, I know the win rates are probably comparable because, right, best ball ten, it's, it's what the top three and, you know, on DraftKings <laughs> Underdog, we're looking to be top two. So I, I understand that they're probably comparable, but just in terms of prioritizing ceiling, I think it's a little more important in tournaments uh, to get away from those tight ends and try and piece it together later. But let's move on to tier two. And all the hype right now is around Kyle Pitt. Can he live up to it? Is he going to be the anomaly that people are expecting him to be? Or or is he being overdrafted? Todd, what are your thoughts on on Kyle Pitts at this point? I have very little. And I wish I had taken more when he was in the fifth and fourth round of drafts. Mm -hmm. Um, But I, you know, again, I draft on the FFPC where he's now going in the second round in the $125 tournament. Uh, That's too rich for my blood. Right. Uh, uh, you know, with the history of tight ends as rookies and what's he going to give you? Right. Like, I, I think you made an excellent point, Ben. You want a first and second round pick to win you the league, mm-hmm. win you a tournament. Um, the chance that Kyle Pitts as a rookie is going to put up 90 to 100 catches, which is what it would probably take to kill you. Uh, one One smart guy once told me. The only thing you have to fear is if the guy you pass on is so good that he absolutely trounces everyone else that's going around him, right? And I just think that I'm I'm much more likely end of the second round to go for an A.J. Brown, a a Calvin Ridley, uh, someone who's been in the league three or four years is still young and has a lot more upside. 
So um, I'm going to have very little Kyle Pitts if this continues. <laughs> Joey, how, how do you feel? I know that we've gone back and forth. We're, we're a big fan of the player and the prospect, but the, the ADP is the issue here. Yeah, and Ben and myself, we draft on underdog and drafters mainly, and he's going at the end of the fourth round, early fifth round right now. Um, I will say I have a lot of Kyle Pitts like in the ninth round shares, which is pretty good pre-draft before he went to Atlanta. But, I mean, the opportunity is there. There's only Kelvin Ridley in that Falcons offense, and this is still going to be one of the more pass-heavy teams in the NFL, in my opinion. Their defense is horrendous. They really did nothing to address that. So I think Matt Ryan will be a candidate to be at least top five in the NFL in pass attempts. And like I said, who else is going to catch passes there? Calvin Ridley. Then they have Russell Gage, Olamide Zacchaeus, Hayden Hurst. Like, none of these guys scare me. Um, Kyle Pitts, at worst, is going to be the Frank second. Darby. <laughs> my deep sleeper frank darby frank darby all right heard it right, heard it here right. on the on this frank darby sleeper but uh there's there's really you know nobody to get targets on that team and obviously we know his athletic profile generational talent and i will say i do agree with the rookie tight end narrative they usually don't perform right out of the gate well and obviously us as players, we are pretty bad at identifying outliers. And I think a lot of people think Kyle Pitts is an outlier, but it's hard not to like the situation that he's in. And it's hard not to like him as a player. So he, it is kind of rich, but I, I think just in terms of the tight ends below him, I don't see any of these guys having the, the same comparable ceiling that Kyle Pitts has, even in year one. The only one that I think you could make the case for is TJ Hawkinson because you talk about the opportunity, and this is another team that is going to be in a lot of negative game scripts. There's going to be a lot of pass attempts, and who else is there? Brashad Perryman, Tyrell Williams. You know, There's 147 targets gone from this Detroit offense with the departure of Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones. I think TJ Hawkinson has a very realistic chance to – you know, come out and lead the Detroit Lions in targets. And I think that that could be a really good situation for him. You know, he's a year three tight end. He's still young. He's right at that age where he should be breaking out. You know, how do you guys feel about Hawkinson in comparison to Pitts? I I feel, um, you know, again, where I'm, I, I do draft an underdog too, but mm -hmm. where I, I'm seeing him mostly, he's, he's around later than Kyle Pitts. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but he even is. If you look at the Rotoviz charting, his uh, he's gone up almost around in the last uh, couple months. Um, I I don't know that you guys like this guy, but I'm big on Mark Andrews for tournaments. Mm -hmm. I think that last year in FFPC he was being uh, taken at the you know the one the the two three turn, and I had almost none. I thought that was way too rich. But I've been getting him mid to late fourth round in FFPC. He's super talented. Any week he could give you two touchdowns. And as a best ball quote expert, uh, I'm looking for spike weeks, right? I think mm -hmm. Hawkinson will be more consistent. I think Hawkinson's more likely to give you that, you know, seven for 70. But I think that Andrews is the guy who can give you the two touchdown weeks uh, on a on a much better offense, I do think that offense is going to bounce back. I don't think it's going to be as efficient as it was two years ago, and I don't think it's going to be as bad as it was last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and transitioning to dis to discuss Mark Andrews, he's a guy that I think we've been up and down on in the past. Maybe some of the bias comes from those weeks where he would just drop touchdowns, and in we were DFS, starting the DFS. Yeah. Yep, pain. Be just tough. Money, nothing worse than that in DFS. <laughs> money, money just falling out of our wallets every single week. We we rostered Mark Andrews, but to me, the real concern with Mark Andrews is just the addition of all these targets. Now, I don't think it's like going to knock him necessarily down the peg, but it's just, you know, how much passing volume is there going to be in this Ravens offense and how is it going to be distributed with the additions of Rashad Bateman and Tylen Wallace, et cetera. I, I will say that I I'll throw this out for you to consider uh, when you add talent and you've got mm -hmm. Marquise Brown who can take the top off. And now you've got Bateman who's got this amazing move off the line. You know, he's going to be open a lot. Uh, it's, you know, the defense last year double teamed Mark Andrews a lot. I expect him to make up for the volume a little bit by not being as covered as he was in mm -hmm. the past. That's a good point, Joey. Uh, where do you stand on Mark Andrews as far as 2021 goes? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't hate Mark Andrews by any means. Um, I just have very few shares because he's going when the fifth, sixth round, somewhere in that area, yep. and I just uh, see my or I just tend to draft more wide receivers in that range. So it's just a matter of like where he's going and who he's going around in terms of best ball drafts on underdog. Um, so I don't have many shares of him. Um, the Ravens have been the most run-heavy team in the NFL over the last two years, which obviously hurts the pass catchers in that Ravens offense. And then obviously there's still those concerns that people have about Lamar Jackson as a passer. Um, I don't really have those concerns, but that is something to take into consideration. Uh, but yeah, I mean, Mark Andrews, he does have those two touchdown weeks in his range of outcomes, which is good for fantasy, but I think he's going to be more of a, of, of a floor player in my opinion. Uh, uh, what I like about him in best ball is you don't have to pick the weeks. True. Right? Yeah. True. You don't have yeah. to pick the weeks that he explodes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the last player in this second tier for me is Dallas Goddard. Now, if we're looking at things through an ADP lens, Goddard, I think, consensus would be in the tier below this because he's going closer to those you know the Noah fans of the world the Higbees the Gasickis but to me the 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 upside is there you know there is room for him to grow with Zach Ertz on the way out with the lack of other established targets Devontae Smith coming in as an undersized rookie Jalen Rager you know potentially being a bust who knows he could he could bounce back as a sophomore but Goddard you know should have all the opportunity in the world he has the athleticism to do it and he's been productive for you know long stretches he's been a productive fantasy asset as the number two tight end in this offense and now he's the clear-cut number one um you know how do you guys feel about Dallas Goddard in comparison to these guys is he a step below or can you see him elevating into this tier well I I think that everything you said is true but you have to mix in the fact that there's going to be, you know, Zach Ertz isn't gone yet. It appears that he's going to be gone. But what percentage do you think he might not be? Let's say it's 20%, right? Mm -hmm. it, you know, so that's what keeps Goddard in the Noah Fant tier for me. And I've got those two in the same tier and Higby and, and the other fellows you mentioned below that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so what I do is I've been just mixing Goddard and Fant uh, a lot of drafts, I don't take the early three, and the next three are going, you know, earlier than I want sometimes. Uh, but I don't always like constantly to be waiting till the, the tier after that. Uh, and I do think the other positions kind of peak a little bit. So um, I, what I do is I've been buying Fant and Goddard when they're down about a half round. Mm. You know, yeah, that, uh, that makes sense. What, 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 or if there's a correlation, you know, you're talking about mm -hmm. tournaments and DFS. Um, I'm looking at that week's. This is something I got from Justin Herzig to give credit where it's due. Uh, I, I I am very aware right now of, you know, if I get a team to week 17, uh, can I correlate it? And, you know, not drop a tier to correlate. But if I'm looking at, you know, Philadelphia plays Washington. So if I've got Terry McLaurin and I like Fanton Goddard the same, well, that, that's, a, uh, that's a Goddard draft for me, right? Uh -huh. um, I think Denver plays um, the, the Chargers uh, week 17. I'd have to double check that one. But if I have Keenan Allen, well, then Noah Fant would be a better choice. So I, I, I'm a big fan of, of using correlations like DFS to help break ties uh, within a tier. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Philly is also a team that has two home games in the uh, playoffs in weeks 15 through 17 for these uh, tournaments, which I think is also a good thing to look at right now at this point. Obviously, it's really hard to project who's going to be, you know, favorites, who's going to be implied team totals, but, you know, have higher implied team totals. But at least we can look at the home teams to give us a slight indication this far out. Uh Moving on to like tier that. three. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tier three, guys. So this is a tier that we sort of have labeled as boom bust guys that we think have sort of the athletic profile, the talent, and the or and or the opportunity to produce boom weeks, but it just might not be on as consistent of a basis or as high of a ceiling as the guys that we previously mentioned. This tier consists of Noah Fant, Mike Gesicki, uh, John U. Smith, Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry, and Anthony Ferkser. Uh, gentlemen, who stands out to you on this list? Todd, I know that you mentioned you're higher on Noah Fant than perhaps some of these other players. Yeah, I, I've got Fant in the tier above with Dallas Goddard. Um, he's a good spike week guy. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that Teddy Bridgewater throws more short passes, which, and then you get Sutton back, which is going to open up the field. So um, 
I, I think Higby's been growing on me lately because he, you know, he did really have that one period a couple years ago where he was dominant. Um, I also like the New England guys more than most people do. Um, I'm not even afraid to take both of them because I think that if you have both on the team, you're going to get a good week, you know, and you get them one in the 10th and, and on underdog Hunter Henry's going way too late. Like, I mean, that's just a no brainer second tight end for me. If I get, you know, one of the top guys and I only want to go with two tight ends, Hunter Henry in like the 13th to 15th round is mm -hmm. just stealing. Hunter Henry is the tight end 20 on underdog right now, which yeah, I, a, which I agree is way too late. Absolutely. That's, absurd. That, that, that's just free money to me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm looking at the same thing as Janu. I mean, Janu is going behind the likes of like Robert Tunyon and Adam Troutman right now. I mean, both of these guys, you know, combined, they got 50 a million Adam guaranteed. <laughs> <laughs> Adam zero share Troutman. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we're right on yeah. that same page. Hands down, the most overdrafted tight end oh in my, my opinion. Gosh. Right yeah. now. I I have no Troutman either. But as a Patriots fan, I like I like these signings. These were two of our better free agent signings um, this year. And I don't know if people realize that these are going to be the two most targeted players on the Patriots team. You know, besides maybe Aguilar or Jacoby Myers, like those are just, you know, not really difference makers at the wide receiver position. The offense is going to run through the running back and run through the tight ends in the pass game. You mean Ramondre. Yeah. <laughs> Ramondre. No, I'm a Damian Harris guy. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, yeah, just Janu and um, Hunter Henry, I, I like them both. And like we just talked about, they are going, you know, pretty late. Uh, like I mentioned, Hunter Henry's the tight end 20, and Jonu Smith is what the tight end 16. That's so crazy. it's both, they're both, it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it, yeah. It's yeah. just, they're, they're, they're two of the top seven or eight talented tight ends yep. in the league. And in general, you mentioned Aguilar, you mentioned Jacoby Myers. Uh, at first, I was like everyone else, oh, Patriots, Cam can't throw the ball. And then, and then you remember, Every year, people forget someone's going to catch the ball. Yeah, right. Exactly. You know, it, and and Aguilar's going super late. Jacoby's not even getting drafted. <laughs> yeah, and so no. I've been steadily uh, uh, adding to my New England wide receiver shares lately. Yeah, um, the guy that I really want to make the case for that I've ended up uh, with the most in this tier is Mike Gesicki. I think everything is lining up perfectly for him to have a really solid year this year. You look at the rest of the players. I mean, yes, a lot of mouths to feed Miami. Don't get me wrong, but these guys all profile more so as outside receivers. And, you know, Mike Kosicki should be the guy in the slot. He was second at the tight end position in slot snaps last year. He had a dominant share of air yards, third most at the position, fourth most receiving yards, you know, uh, true catch rate is was high for him as well he's just a guy that has all the athletic tools and i think he has the opportunity to really work more so out of the slot than a lot of these other tight ends that are going to be in line yeah i mean i i, I like gasicki i like his athletic profile obviously we we've seen the one-handed catches the great plays that he made but i just want to give a shout out to uh, another channel bulletproof fantasy he did a video on how mike gasicki has been actually like a disappointment from like a real life perspective and obviously i don't want to go over all the points he made and i haven't watched a video in a while but i think it's a it's a good video and sums up pretty much about how like even with his athletic profile he he's just disappointed and he hasn't been good in fantasy he wasn't good last year i would know i had him on my team in our uh home league and mm -hmm. I, I don't know it's just there's more targets now with will fuller there they drafted Jalen waddle they still have Devonte parker miles gaskin is there um I, improve, I improve targets though if you if you're on team two a bounce back like you know <laughs> i am yeah no that is, that is true but I, I don't know i feel like i feel like he's in the right category because he is a boom or bust player but the bus happened more frequently last year than mm -hmm. the booms Yep, fair, my, fair point for sure. My, my concern with him also is I think that's a team that prefers to run the ball and play defense and to protect Tua. Mm -hmm. And then you've added Waddle, who can play the slot. You know, now you've got three good wide receivers. Um, I think that is going to lessen Gesicki's slot. 
And I also think the fact that they were so tied to Kyle Pitts in the pre-draft process, uh, I just kind of came away a little concerned about Kaziki. I, when I heard you make the case, Ben, I thought to myself, you know, there's nothing that Ben said that's not true. I just also see a lot more negatives than a Hunter Henry, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I don't think he's, uh, back to my original point, that, you know, the only way someone kills you is if they dominate their draft spot. And so I'm light on Gasicki, and I find it hard to uh, find a scenario where he kills me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't argue what you said either. Todd, let me ask you a question in terms of roster construction. So when it comes to tight end, obviously, if you hit on one of the top three, you're not drafting three tight ends. Uh, I, I consider that for the second tier as well, the Hawkinsons, the Pitts, the Andrews. If those are the guys that I land in, in the mid rounds of the draft, I'm only drafting two tight ends. Um, in, in terms of roster construction, if you miss on those top two tiers, are you going to be drafting three players from this group? Are you going to be drafting three tight ends? Is it going to be a two tight end build where you try and hammer two of the guys from this tier and then just let it ride? Or, you know, is this tier not strong enough for you to feel good going with only two? It, it really depends on the team, right? Mm -hmm. So ideally, again, talking about Justin Herzig and, you know, his two, four, 10, two strategy, which a lot of people are emulating to the point where I think it's going to be less effective this year. Yeah. Um, so I, because tight end is, is going so late on underdog, I find that I normally can get Fant or Goddard at a spot where I think they're worth it. So I, I'm not coming into too many drafts without two that I feel good enough going to war with. So mm -hmm. most of my underdog drafts are going to have two. But, uh, you know, even Justin Herzig says that last pick, that 18th round pick, is for up the uh, to to shore up the spot you're weakest at, and if mm. you think you're going to be weak at tight end, you know maybe you don't wait to the to the last round to 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 hit it, uh, and you know with again with a Hunter Henry in the 15th 16th round, uh, so I will have some three tight end builds, but in general, I want to have two tight ends. I want to mix them up. I want to mix because the two positions that have the lowest win rates are tight end and quarterback. So by mm -hmm. going two and mixing them up, what you're doing is you're giving the high value um, uh, areas more, more uh, opportunity to hit. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, guys. Let's move on to tier four. And to me, this is sort of a risk reward tier. Uh, started off with Tyler Higby, Irv Smith. We have Gerald Everett, Blake Jarwin, Cole Komet, uh, Tanyan, uh, Dan Arnold, OJ Howard, Jared Cook, and Chris Herndon. You know, these are sort of the last guys that I'm really interested in, and they're all over the place in ADP. You know, Tanyan's going ahead of you some of the guys we've already in. talked about. I wouldn't, but yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you, but Gronk, yeah, for sure. Um, I, I could see the case for that as well. Dan Arnold is a guy, you know, on drafters, he's going in the 20th round after pick, you know, 215. So these guys are all over the place. You know, you can take them at different spots, but – does anybody in this tier stand out to you, Todd? I know that you mentioned you've been coming around to Tyler Higby lately. The, the best value at ADP, I think, is Gerald Everett. Mm. Um, I think he's going really late. Russ has um, focused on tight ends at time. Uh, Everett has the talent. Uh, uh, you know, I'm the type. I always want to bet on talent, and I mm. want and I want a discount, right? So uh, I'll mention Everett simply because he goes five, six, seven rounds after a lot of the guys that you mentioned are in the same tier. He's, but he's got a talent profile that is uh, right there with those guys. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's the one that, I would, uh, that, that I, I've been highest on lately. Attached to an elite quarterback as well. Exactly. Who, who throws like a perfect deep ball. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if I'm if I'm drafting um, out of this tier, I'm drafting those players that are attached to great offenses. So Gerald Everett, Blake Jarwin, you know, you can get those guys in the 14th, 15th, 16th round. And then I'm kind of staying away from like Dan Arnold, OJ Howard, Jared Cook. I mean, le let's be real. They shouldn't even be in this tier. Um, they should be like in they're tier not, six. They're not, some of them aren't for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm never drafting, you know, OJ Howard or 
Jared Cook or or Dan Arnold. I mean, Cook is in the tier for me. He is. Uh, he, he he's the last guy for me in the tier. Okay. Uh, I don't have Herndon in there. I do have Gronk simply because we still saw with Gronk in that Super Bowl he can put up two touchdowns. You know his ADP is fine. Uh, I don't have a lot of them, but I do have them in the tier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, I'll say my most owned player is definitely Gerald Everett. So I'm right there with you. Um, I love Gerald Everett and best ball. Probably Blake Jarman would, would be my second guy. But other than that, I've been staying away from pretty much every tight end in this tier because, you know, ADP wise, Higby and Tunyon are going, what, in the ninth, 10th round. Irv Smith is 11th, 12th. Like, I don't know. I just don't really see the upside with these guys. And, you know, we'll talk about uh, Higby's re- replacement um, sooner than later in a, in a couple minutes here. So, yeah, yeah, for sure we will. And, and to me, the thing that I'm looking at these players in similar tiers, but their ADPs are all over the place. So I'm going to be ending up a lot more with the Everett's, the Comets, you know, even the Dan Arnold, who I do believe I have has a lot of side. Yeah, I, people are just got to realize on, on FPPR, Jimmy Graham's still there. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get a lot of the touchdowns, but yeah. I do. I, I I mean, I think Cole commits an up and coming player. Uh, yeah. would, wouldn't be surprised if uh, in a year or two, when they finally get rid of this coaching <laughs> staff, uh, <laughs> that, that he turns into a top seven, eight tight end. Yeah, uh, I, I don't think we'll have to wait too long for a new uh, coaching overhaul in Chicago. Guys, Tier 5, this is sort of a safety net tier. These are guys, I mean, Logan Thomas at this point, I'm absolutely getting none of him. Um, to me, he's just a straight-up compiler. He doesn't really have the, st- the spike weak capability, which is why I have him ranked below a lot of these guys, and I just don't see the targets replicating after he was able to get so many last year after they added, you know, Diami Brown, Curtis Samuel. Um, you know, we expect Antonio Gibson to take a step forward. McKissick's still there. McLaurin's going to be dominant. I just, I see him as a clear cut player. Who's going to regress and, and Eric Ebron. I don't know. You know, Joey, are you an Eric Ebron guy? He's just a guy that I never find myself drafting. He should still have opportunities and we know he's a touchdown scorer at, at some points. Yeah. I mean, I don't draft much Eric Ebron, but he's going as the tight end 26 on underdog. So I think that's fine value. Yeah. He's going to be the starter. He's going to be out on the field, but obviously a lot of competition in Pittsburgh. And then they also they also drafted uh, Pat, Pat Fryermuth out of Penn State, so rookie tight end there as well. So I don't have many shares of e- of Ebron. Don't really care for him that much. Logan Thomas, I think he should be in a couple tiers above tier five, just because tight ends are just obviously terrible. Um, they score the least amount of fantasy points, and he's going to be consistent. Like I think he's going to get you. I think he's going to get you consistent fantasy points every single week. Now, obviously, is he going to have those spike weeks? Probably not. He didn't really have those last season, even though um, you know that I was on Logan Thomas in the in the 18th and 20th round. Yeah, he was a value at that I, point. He, it's just that value is gone when you have to take him in the ninth. Yeah, I mean, he had two games above 20 points last year in full PPR, and I expect that to stay around the same for 2021 like you mentioned all of the additions on offense um I, I don't agree with logan thomas being the tight end 10 but i do think he will be one of the more consistent tight ends so he's probably going to finish as a tight end one or close to it but he's not going to give you those spike weeks you need to win basketball to win in basketball Todd, how- are, you, are you a logan thomas fan i started the offseason pretty high on him and i've kind of backed off because I think you can get guys a little bit later. I do think the drop-offs, you know, the he, he was, you know, Alex Smith and, and, and the quarterbacks there were more dink and dunk types. But I do think the man has talent. I think you're mm-hmm. underrating him a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, again, I think he's going probably two or three players ahead of where he would, so I don't own a lot. But... Um, I, 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 I'm not writing him off. Um, mm. I, I'm not writing last year off as a fluke. Uh, converted quarterback, a lot of talent. Um, might even throw you a couple touchdown passes this year. <laughs> he threw one last year. Yeah. Uh, it's not like they got too much else going on at quarterback. All right, gentlemen, the final tier of this video, tier six, and this one I just call the pit of despair. I mean, if you have any of these guys on your roster, you're not doing great as far as I'm concerned. We'll put it on the screen. There's too many guys to list here, but is there anybody that people should be buying into, anybody that belongs to be elevated out of this tier? 
Not um, not for an 18 round draft. Yeah. Not for an eight. Uh, I mean, I do have a little bit of Kyle Granson on uh, FFPC as a yeah. third tight end, uh, but um, you know, really, and and if you're really desperate, um, in a in a scenario, you know, Jimmy Graham because of the touchdowns we talked about, you know, he's going to get six to ten touchdowns, but he's only going to get two t- catches for eight yards, um, so. Uh, but that's for me 28 round FFPC best balls. I'm taking my third or fourth tight end, you know, Jimmy Graham and Kyle Rudolph, the one guy that no one is drafting. And I don't think he's an 18 round guy, but the Giants paid a lot of money for him. And I know that doesn't always mean a lot, but they don't like the fact that Engram can't block. And I think that mm-hmm. Kyle Rudolph's going to be on the field a lot more than people think. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't be shocked. To, you know, he's still a talented guy. I wouldn't be shocked if he gave you 40, 50 catches. So mm-hmm. um, I, I, that if you want my deepest old guy sleeper, it's Kyle Rudolph. Deepest old guy sleeper, Joey. Give us a, give us a deep young guy sleeper. I know you've got one in this tier that you're pretty bullish on. Yeah, so one of the guys that I'm very high on is Jacob Harris in this tier. And he is the current Rams tight end, too. Converted wide receiver went to UF or went to UCF. Um, the Rams drafted him to be a tight end in the fourth round. Um, yes, yeah, so just so when I'm drafting late, I'm just drafting you know guys that I think have the athletic upside to get on the field and get on the field early. And I think that is Jacob Harris. He's running as the Rams tight end one with Tyler Higby not participating in Rams OTAs, and he's been impressing the coaching staff. And Sean McVay has had nothing but great words about Jacob Harris. And besides that four game stretch back in what 2018 when Gerald Everett missed, um, Tyler Higby hasn't done much in his career and uh i'm just willing to bet on jacob harris's upside but uh it might it might have cut off he's not a tight end or listed as a tight end i should say on these best ball sites so that's truly unfortunate um but it is what it is i have like two shares of jacob harris even as a wide receiver (laughs) yeah it's just unfortunate he's not a tight end because i think he would have appeal it's just hard to go there as a wide receiver it's just you know what is he going to give you one or two weeks maybe of viability but i I definitely like him and especially in dynasty he he's a great stash in in my opinion um you got to save the 18th round for byron pringle Mm. That you do. I've been scooping up a lot of Byron Pringle lately. That and some <laughs> Ke- some Keelan Cole. Uh, the the only guy, and you mentioned Kylan Granson. That's one that we've talked about on the podcast that I that I like. Uh, the only other guy in this tier that I have some slight interest in, and we talked about it earlier with Gerald Everett, is the guy that Everett replaces, and that's Jacob Hollister, who went to Buffalo completely free in every draft. Nobody's taking a shot on him, and he's now attached to Josh Allen in Buffalo. They went to college together. They have an established chemistry. Um, and again, just shower being attached. Narrative. Mm-hmm. Shower narrative. Yep. Shout out to Levitan. Absolutely. Hol- I mean, Hollister, there's a shot there. You know, They've showered together. He's in an elite offense, uh, and this is going to be a pass-happy team. I think there's I, I, I there. don't hate it. <laughs> I mean, I'm I I'm I'm not drafting Jacob Hollister, <laughs> Dawson Knox. Um, just not gonna have a not you know, eighteen round. Yeah, not no. he's not gonna have a week to week role. But I, I think you know the one guy that we touched on a little bit ago and we kind of skipped over is Troutman. He's uh-huh. going on underdog right now as the tight end fifteen. So that's above Janu, Gronk, Ferkser, Blake <laughs> Jarwin, Hunter Henry, Gerald Everett. So he's being drafted as a high tight end too, and you have him in your last tier, pit of despair. I just need you to elaborate uh, why you have him. I think he should be higher because well, he is the clear cut, you know, tight end one in New Orleans. Not much in terms of competition for targets there either. I know the QB situation is something that is concerning, but if Winston starts, I mean Troutman's going to be on the field, and he has a solid athletic profile as well. I'll give our guest Todd the first word because he he's just giggling over there when you said he was the <laughs> tight end fifteen. Like, yeah. So so Todd, I know we're on the same page here. What what are your reservations with with Troutman? Why are you a zero share guy? Well, I mean, New Orleans has never been. It, you know, Jimmy Graham was a unicorn. So mm-hmm. right. You know, but you know, Sean Payton was there well before Jimmy Graham, and he's been there well after Jimmy Graham. A lot of guys have come and gone, and they're just contributors, right? And then. You know, I, I just don't see it. 
I just don't even know that he's going to be the number one on his own team. Um, so he's going two or three rounds too early, two or three tiers higher than I would be scooping shares. Um, I'll put it in the it could happen, but um, I don't think he's going to be good enough to make me regret not taking yeah. it. No, nah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I just brought it up for, you know, the conversation um, because Ben yeah, has him in his last tier. I don't know in the pit of but, despair. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> but if I had to draft him at his ADP, I would I mean, despair. Hell no. Hell no. I'm not, I have zero shares, too. Like, I, I agree. I'm not drafting Troutman above, you know, the guys that I listed. Hunter Henry, Janu, um, Gerald Everett. Never, ever. Yeah, um, underdog, the underdog tight end ADP is so different than the FFPCs. Yeah. Um, you know, Hunter Henry is going ninth, 10th round. John who's going ninth, 10th round. Troutman's more like 12th, 13th round. Mm -hmm. um, and he's still going around tight ends that I think have better upside. And, um, you know, maybe I got blinders on. It's possible that I do. But no. I like guys who flash when they do play. And I don't think he flashed when he did play. Right? So, you know... Sometimes we get caught up in being, you know, like you need opportunity, but you also need talent to take advantage of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And I, I just didn't see enough to make me worry that I'm not taking uh, Troutman. And I worry about everything. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're all on the same page there. Uh, Todd, before we get out of here, do you have any final words that you could give to the audience just about the tight end position in general as a whole as you approach it? Uh, from, in terms of best ball tournaments? I, I would say, you know, I'm a big exposure guy. And as I mentioned, win rates at tight end and at quarterback tend to be lower than uh, running back and wide receiver. So mix up your, mix up your tight ends. Uh, don't fall in love with one or two guys and end up with 30%, 40%, especially if you're, you know, because if you're going into the week tournament weeks, um, you know, Got you know if you don't have any of Troutman and he catches two touchdowns, you know mm -hmm. maybe you don't advance mm -hmm. uh, just simply because you had zero shares. Now that's a bad example, but my point is there's no. It, it's also a position with more injury than any position but running back. So keep your exposure in line at the position. Uh, you know if you have tiers, mix it up within the tiers, and I think you'll be fine. Yep, that's that's an absolutely great point, and, and thank you for sharing it. Gentlemen, that is going to be it for episode 147 of the DFS Dose podcast. If you are not already, make sure you are following us on Twitter at the DFS Dose. I'm at Ben Hover. Joey is at Joey Carrion DFS. And, of course, you can find Todd at Best Ball NFL. Todd, do you want to let the good people know where they can find you and support your content? Yeah, uh, I, I run the Run to Daylight podcast tomorrow night. Friday night, we're going to be doing a Football Guys $350 season log league. Uh, it's our third season. It's 50% guys like myself, middle tier analysts, and 50% successful high stakes players. I'll be hosting the pod. We're going to have about six of the guys on the podcast while we're drafting. Um, and two time defending champion, I, I, I can't pronounce his name, but a, a, a Beeb. Won two years in a row the F uh, the football guys tournament for seven hundred and fifty grand. He's going to be in the tournament. Dave Jeez. Hubbard, uh, Austin Martin, uh, Dan Williamson, just a lot of uh, hot high low who was on your pod yep. is in that league. Noah Rudell with Evan Silva. Uh, yep. So it's uh, it's a really good time. You can check us out tomorrow. Yeah, definitely check that out. Sounds like a star-studded lineup for that draft. Todd, thank you again so much for coming on the show. We'll be back with the final edition of this four-part series to break down the wide receiver position with a guest to be determined. Uh, look out for that on the YouTube channel as well as wherever you listen to podcasts. As always, if you guys are listening out there, we appreciate you. We value you. Until next time, let's stay accountable and keep it authentic.